week. Um, welcome. We love you guys. Thanks for being here. Before I jump into the word, uh, I'm going to just say a quick word of prayer and we can jump right in. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for this time. We thank you for a blessed week. We thank you for your protection, O oh God. Uh, I just submit myself before your word, O oh Father God, and before you, Jesus. Um, God, let the words that I speak, may it be uh, what you've really instructed for your people, O oh God. Let it be what they need, O oh Father, the, the, the very word of God that is piercing their hearts, their minds, and their soul, Father God. And I pray that your presence is with them. Jesus, um, thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So, um, for the past year or so, uh, 13 months or so, God has been really laying uh, a simple, simple topic on my mind, uh, something that I didn't understand for a very long time, and it's this whole concept of obedience. And uh, if you ask my parents <laughs> or anybody, I'm probably the most rebellious child, the most disobedient child, uh, well, maybe. But uh, I, I think that growing up, I made it very difficult for them, and uh, I never understood that disobedience never got me anywhere. It didn't earn me anything. It didn't warrant me anything. It didn't, it didn't get me anything that I needed. It only made my life more difficult. Uh, and, and that concept never really sunk into me. But as the years passed, uh, I began to learn that what God had intended for my life is much different if I'd only obeyed what he had called me to do. Now, you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with anything? The reality of the fact is that I think that oftentimes we go throughout our lives living a life of disobedience, expecting a different type of outcome. So let's jump into Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, and we'll see where that takes us. So uh, it says... If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, this isn't some prosperity gospel. If you just obey God, all the things in your life is going to go well. And you're going to get the nice car and the nice house. And you've got to have a great job. No, I'm probably telling you the exact opposite. Uh, if you listen to God, your life is probably going to get a little harder uh, in context of what the world is telling you. If you listen to what God is telling you, you're not going to always get what you want, but you're always going to get what he needs in your life and what he wants for you and I. So as I was reading Isaiah, and I've been meditating on this, this, this chapter for the past year or so, uh, I started at the beginning, and some context is that Isaiah is writing this because God gave him a vision about Judah and Jerusalem and just the children of Israel and their life of disobedience. If we look at verses 2 and 3, we can see uh, you can almost hear God's emotion, almost like agony in his voice about what the children of God were doing. So verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the, children, uh, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. If you read that again and again, you can hear the voice of a pained parent, someone who's so in agony of the very children that he brought out, he provided for, that he loves for, and he cares for time and time again, yet they choose to rebel. The very children that he, he cares so deeply about, it says that they have rebelled against me. And he goes so far as to compare that the, an ox knows its master, that uh, the donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. The children of Israel seem to have a hard time hearing. And as you go throughout the rest of this chapter, you can see in verse 11, it says, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lambs or of goats. It literally says in the ESV translation, I've had enough of your burnt offerings. I think for so long in my life, I thought that I could do X, Y, and Z, and I could live my life from Monday to Friday doing whatever I wanted, living as I pleased in whatever way it took for me to live. And then on Friday, I'll just go to Bible study, and then Saturday, do this, go to church. And that portion of my life, I'm going to live in obedience to God, or that area of my life. 
Now, if you're taking notes, the title of this message is just simple obedience. And you're probably wondering, what exactly does that mean? See, simple obedience asks us to be willing. Now, if we look at verse 19 again, it talks about if you are willing and obedient. The first concept of being simply obedient to what God has called for each and every one of us in our lives is to be willing. Now, if we look at uh, Genesis chapter 6 onwards, in in verses 6 onwards, we see the story of Noah. Now, everybody knows the story of Noah. He lived in a generation that was so wicked, so perverse, that the Lord literally says he regretted making man. Can you imagine the Almighty God looking at his creation and being the very grievance and saying, I regret making man. And then we go on to see that out of all the wickedness in the world, there was one man who decided that he was going to be obedient to what God had called him to do. And the man was Noah. See, Noah found favor in God's eyes. And if we go to verse 13 onwards, we see a Noah, um, we see God talking to Noah and, and, and telling him, hey, like, I'm going to wipe out this earth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just reset, but I need you to build an ark. I don't know about you, but if God told me to build an, a straight petagum, I would, I would just not do it. Like, it doesn't make any sense to, to make an ark in the midst of a generation like this. See, you and I live in wickedness around us, and we have the opportunity to be influenced by external forces, just like Noah. We have the opportunity to go do this and that and live in, in partial obedience or live this area of our life in obedience and do this and that. But the reality is that we shouldn't, right? And so as, as we go on throughout the rest of the chapter, God gives him a list of expre- uh, instructions, and we get to verse 22, and it says, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. He didn't do some of it. He didn't do part of it. He didn't just think, oh, if I uh, just, uh, just you know, do this area of my life, and I'll go to work and do this. No, in the midst of a wicked generation, for years, every day, Noah woke up and made a choice to be willingly obedient. The reality, church, is that every day you and I have a choice to be willingly obedient to God. You wake up every morning and you and I make choices. And just like that, Noah made a choice for hundreds of years as he was building this ark to be obedient even when people are telling him this is not going to work This is never going to end up well for you. This is all in vain. It's never going to be good for you and your family. And yet you can see the end result. If we go to the life of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, we can see the same thing. We can see how God called him in verse 1 to go out of his country, just depart out of this goodness of the land. And and in verse 4, you can see that Abraham, it says that Abraham went as the Lord had told him. He took Sarah, he took He took took his uh, nephew Lot, and he just went. And you can see the end result of his life as well. Church, the reality is that if you want to be obedient to what God has called us to do, not that any of us are perfect in any way, but it takes a willingness for you to make a choice every single day to say, you know what, God, regardless of what the world is saying or what's going on around me, I'm going to be obedient to whatever you've called me to do. And as The greatest example of that is Jesus, right? When we look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses um, verses 2. Looking to Jesus, um, uh, Hebrews 12, 2, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and is seated at the right hand of God, right? So we're looking at a Jesus who came down, who came down for, for the perfection of our faith for us, And he was obedient to endure suffering on the cross. Can you imagine the creator becoming like creation? Can you imagine God coming down for people like you and I who are always disobedient, always willing to go the extra mile to do the wrong thing? That's God coming down, being obedient in the truest form, despising everything and sitting at the right hand throne of God. It's great to be willingly obedient, and, and that's what God has called us to do, but as well as being willingly obedient, it brings me to my next point of being uh, unwaveringly obedient, uh, to have unwavering obedience. Now, if we turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, we can see the same Jesus, and it says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself 
by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God humbled himself. He became the lowest of the lows for you and I to the point of death, and that too, death on a cross, the lowest and the worst way to die. And if we look back at the the story and the life of Noah and of Abraham, we can see the same type of unwavering obedience, that every day they woke up, regardless of what people said to them, regardless of what people did to them, they chose to follow a Jesus. They followed a God in which, regardless of their failures, regardless of what they did, they made a choice and they were unwavering in that choice, even when life got difficult. Now, God doesn't say that in our when we obey, we'll just be perfect. You and I will fail. Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, For the righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumbles in times of calamity. We will fail. I will fail. We'll all fail. It's just the reality of the fact. In obedience, we will fail multiple times. and We will have suffering. We will have times where it's so difficult for us to obey that it's just, we will fail. But the reality is that we get up and we keep going and we keep obeying regardless of what the world is saying or regardless of what people are saying. If we look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, we see a Jesus who, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what, through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Mesilchadek. The reality is that Jesus was perfect through the obedience. And he learned obedience in suffering. You and I will suffer. We will face financial hardship. You'll face hardship in school. You're always going to hit a wall. This is life. This is the Christian walk. And obedience is not easy. It's not going to be fun. It's not entertaining. It's not the most joyful thing to do, but I want to counter that. Maybe you have freedom in obedience. Maybe in obedience you learn, where can I go? What can I watch? What can I eat? What can I wear? Where can I step? What boundaries do I have that the world is saying, hey, come and do this or come and do this, whereas we know, hey, this is the walk. This is the path. This is the life that God has called you and I to do and to live in, and and that's the reality of the fact. Sometimes in obedience, we'll have to let people go. We'll have to let our friendships go. Sometimes you'll have to add friends that are may not who you think are are the right people, but God has designated for your life. Sometimes you'll have to let go of relationships or put a pin in them and never come back to it because God is saying, hey, I've called you to something else. Maybe God is saying to us children, hey, you just need to be obedient to what your parents are calling you to do, even when it's the hardest thing for you to do. Maybe it's parents being obedient to the fact that, hey, my child is going astray. Maybe he's just going, he or she's going down a path in which we can't save them, but being obedient and diligent to be consistent for them and being uh, the, the parents that God has called you to be. Maybe being obedient in school. That's, that's a big and difficult one for me. Maybe just staying where you are, even though it's taking six years or seven years or eight years, maybe staying in that major, or maybe when God has called you, hey, this is not the walk that I've called you for. Maybe it's something greater, something else that I've called you to do. Maybe in work or whatever area of your life, God has called us to live a life of obedience, and that too, simple obedience. Now, you're probably wondering after all this, Josh, you're talking about obedience, but what are we obeying? I hope we all know who we're obeying, because I'm pretty sure we all know we're supposed to be obeying Jesus, right? But the, the simplicity of the fact is that the, what, we're, what we're obeying is, is really simple. It's not anything difficult. It's to love God, love his people, and to, ex, and to just get expanding his word. If we look at Luke chapter 10, verse 27, that answer is so evident and so clear. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. God has not called us to do anything wild or crazy, and maybe he has. Maybe that's what he's called you to do. But the simplicity always starts with us being with our love for Jesus, and out of that love, loving people around us, and out of that, spreading his word. See, God has called us to know him and make him known. Now, I think that the biggest thing that God has been teaching me is the fact that obedience is not based on an outcome we seek. 
rather on the greatest gift we've received, and that's the gift of life. And, and, and if we look at Hebrews chapter 11, we see all these heroes of faith, right? We see people like Noah and Abraham and all these people who have lived a life of, of faith and called into obedience and been obedient to that faith. And, and we come down to verse 13, and this is something I think a lot of people skip over. It says that these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. Every one of these heroes of faith, people that we consider, we are looking at them in, in such highlight, but we don't realize that they may not have received that promise the things that you and I hope for, the good job, the good house, whatever it is that we're seeking out, we may not never receive it. What God says back in Isaiah 1 verse 19 is that if we're willing and obedient, we'll see the goodness of the land. And that land is one day. It's not the fact that we get the blessings of this world today or even that you'll get the best things of life today. It's the reality that maybe you may never get it at all, but you will learn what being obedient to God is, and you'll learn what loving the Lord is in that obedience. And as the worship team comes forward, I'll read one last uh, couple of verses, and it's just Romans 5, verses 18 to 19. Uh, and, and just when we really look at it at church and whoever's watching, um, this really, really brings it back to the fact that it's all about God and what we're doing for him. And, 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 and it's not about what we do, but what he's done. So Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. See, for by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. One man decided to sin and the whole world was condemned. But one man... One God chose to humble himself, come down to a lowly state, the creator becoming creation, at the lowest point, choosing to become like us so that obedience, in obedience we were made righteousness. So if you're hearing this today and you're thinking, man, like maybe there are areas of my life I'm not obedient in or, or areas of my life that I may not fully want to see Jesus, I ask, I'll ask you, Maybe ask God to come into those areas and teach you what, what simple obedience is. Just, because just like you, I'm also learning this. This is just one small, small portion to a larger thing. And I'll say this again. Obedience is not based on the outcome that you and I seek. It's rather based on the greatest gift we've received. And that's the gift of knowing Jesus and to make him known to the nations. So if, you, if you're listening to this and you don't know Jesus, invite him into your heart today. Go seek him out. I, I pray that, you know, you find the God of the universe who died for you and I. And as I close in prayer and we just get into an attitude of worship, um, just keep your mind on this. Father, we just thank you, Jesus, for this time. God, I thank you that you are an amazing God who has died for us, our sins. We are not worthy of anything, God. Lord, we just submit ourselves. We give you glory. We give you honor, God. We pray that in every day you teach us what it means to live in a life of simple obedience, God. And if there's anyone watching or hearing this, Lord, and they don't know you, God, I pray that you, you invade their heart, that you penetrate, that your word is penetrating their heart and their mind and their soul, God, and that you are showing them the same Jesus that saved us, so oh Lord Jesus. And I pray that they find you, that they seek you out, and they find true peace in you, Jesus, even in the midst of everything, oh God. We give you glory, we give you honor. In Jesus' name I pray.